Alright, let's talk about the pulverizer. So we got coal silo. We've got a motor operated gate valve. That goes down to a feeder. Feeder dumps into the pulverizer itself, and that feeds down onto the grinding table. The grinding table is turned by a gear box, which is turned by a big 4160 motor. And then we've got Wheels, limited clearance. So we got wheel, there's three of them, but you can't draw three. There's, and they sit in the groove of that motor, or that table. And so the coal comes down and the table turns because of the shape of the table. There's a triple force, it gets slung out under the wheel, and the wheel grinds it up. And then it gets ground up into until it's like powder. There's what well, probably should have uh, reviewed before I did this. So this wheel has like a hinge on it, and it has a couple of springs that hold it down. So it actually has some little bit of bitty bit to adjust in case something gets in there that's not going to get ground up like the coal is. So something like concrete or a wrench or whatever. Check, uh, check nail. Yeah. <laughs> Nails from the railroad tracks. Railroad spikes. That's it. <laughs> All right. So then stuff that does get under there gets kicked out and ends up on under the table. And then that gets scooped on and dumped into the pirate hopper. My eraser. Failed to set up. Alright. It's good enough, man. It's on the table behind here. Alright. So we grind up the coal, and then where does it go? Up. To the last wire. Up. All right, up is a good answer. So we are trying to go up. My answer was going to be to the burner, but you're right. Before it goes to the burner, it has to go through the classifier. So the classifier is like a screen and it's got a motor on top that can adjust the space in the screen to make sure that the coal that makes it through the screen is fine enough that it goes up and it burns. Because coal has a lot of energy in it, but you have to get oxygen to all the parts of it for it to actually burn. Otherwise, you get chunks that fall down into the bottom ash and get end up in the bottom ash pile. So, goes through the classifier, the bigger parts fall down, make another lap. What moves it up? What makes it go up to the top? PA fan. Air from the PA fan. All right. So we've got under the table, the air blows in, it blows up, and then you've got that giant guillotine damper, and then you've got a flow control damper, and then you've got hot air and cold air that both come in mixed together. And both of those are coming from the PA fan.
What's PA stand for? Primary. Error. What's primary mean? First. Right. So this is the first air that comes in contact with the coal. The the secondary air comes in the coal at the burner to make sure there's enough oxygen for it to actually burn. We don't call it the secondary air fan. We call it the force draft fan. Either, either naming scheme would end up with one of them being the oddball. So the PA, whew, let's go back to black. Rotary air heater. And the PA blows across that rotary air heater and heats the air up. But not all of it. Some of it skips the rotor here. Here, wow, that was really fast, and that covered a lot. <laughs> so, PA air blows in. Some, most of it gets heated. Some of it bypasses around. The cool air and the hot air mixed together. You got a flow control damper, cut damper, and then that air blows in the bottom of the mill. That blows, the mill is grinding up the coal. The coal is then a fine talcum powder kind of consistency and blowing up through the classifier, up through the cut damper, and then into the boiler itself. <coughs> So what is the purpose of the feeder? Flow control. Flow control. Changing the speed that the feeder runs controls how much coal goes in, which controls how hot the fires are, which then in turn controls how much pressure or megawatts we're making. Right? I guess now we go to the start sequence on a mill. So what's the first thing, first step of starting a mill? Start up, start up. Walk it down. Walk, walk it down. down. That's a better answer. All right. So when we're walking down, we're going to look at each piece of these equipment. So we're going to go to the damp, uh, the uh, coal gate. We're going to make sure that it is in remote, that the power light's lit. <coughs> We're going to go to the feeder. We're going to make sure that the doors are shut. We're going to make sure that the back plate is on. We're going to make sh look through the windows, make sure the belt's not jacked up, not misaligned. Make sure that the chute's not clogged. None of that stuff should be that way, but you'll walk it down because sometimes you're walking into a shit show that somebody else lifted, right? And the controller needs to be seen what? Say, controller, what it needs to say. Well, you need to make sure the controller doesn't have any faults on it, make sure the disconnect's shut and the lights are on, make sure the e-stop is pulled out. Auto stop. Auto stop, is that what you should say? Auto stop, yeah. Manual stop is going to start up. Okay. And it would be in manual stop if the uh, ice text that just calibrated the scale didn't put it back the way it's supposed to be. All right. What else are you looking at? Uh, chain, chain, gate. chain gate. All right. Chain gate is supposed to be shut on a sweep and open when we're done with the sweep. And if it is shut, then right, right, right. The, it, it's not tight, tight. So it will let air by. But this flow control damp will go all the way open and you still won't be getting full flow through it. And that's the kind of low airflow situation where the coal in here isn't, you're not carrying out as much as you're putting in. 
and eventually it builds up until it buries the wheel and trips your trips your uh, motor. Good. Uh, this guy has a power switch on it, but there's not like a local light, and uh, the switch isn't on the lotto, so I don't know when the last time that was a problem was. It's been a long time. We, we kill the power in a lockout, but we kill it in a breaker. We don't kill it locally. Um, these flow control dampers, there's an air valve. You can make sure it's lined up to them. Uh, there's lever arms where you got one arm that pushes three other things, so the veins all turn at the same time. Those have fallen off in the past. There's no reason to think that came undone during a shutdown, but that's stuff you should look for on your walk down daily. Uh, and if those arms aren't right, then you might not be able to get, if one of the cold arms is off, then you'll blow too much cold air in there and you won't be able to get the middle of the temperature you're supposed to. And vice versa if the hot air's off. And if it fail, depends on if it failed open or shut, what kind of symptoms you get. But if they, if they fail, then it's a problem. And they're not hard to fix either. You just uh, have the control room put it in the, the position until the arm lines up with where the vein is and then hook it on there and then there's some sort of cotter pin or something that you got to get back in. You might have to run to the warehouse and get one of those. Or maybe it's laying right fucking there. I don't know. Well, sit there. Make sure the hand wheel spins. Make sure they ain't engaged. All right. Seal air. Aha. So coming off of the cold leg of the PA is the seal air. And that goes to a couple of different ring headers on there. And so because you're blowing this PA air in there and there's coal in there, then the coal is going to want to blow out cracks. And you know we've got a gearbox that comes up and a table that's moving, so there's got to be transitions. So by putting the seal air, which is a slightly higher pressure because it's upstream of these dampers, right? So putting that there closer to where it's going to blow out than the PA air, you don't have coal blowing out. You have clean air blowing out, which doesn't bother me about. So seal air, there's a local mechanism where you engage the hand wheel on it. Normally it's operated from the DCS. When you lock it out properly, when you lock that hand wheel, you're supposed to engage the hand wheel so it can't be operated from the DCS. And then you're supposed to put the, the wire around it, the hand wheel, so everybody can turn it. If somebody clears it and they don't know what they're doing, then they can take the lock off the hand wheel but not disengage the hand wheel so DCS still can't drive it. So that's a good thing to look for on your walk down. That's a common thing to miss. That would happen. They flip or cut. He was out there with it. Since we're on that, we'll go and throw the emergency seal air in there. Where is you get emergency seal air from? Flame scanner cooling fan. It's a good answer. Flame scanner. All right, when would we use emergency seal air? If you don't have any PA fans. So the only time you're going to be doing this without any PA fans, it's not going to be during a startup, it's going to be during a mill sweep, right? Master fuel trip, you lost both, it, it locks out both PA fans, and then you still have four mills to sweep, or you still might have four mills to sweep. I don't know what you got. But when you sweep those mills, you don't want the you don't want all that crap blowing out and the steam blowing out around the table and coal and dust and you still get some of that. But the emergency seal air is way better than nothing. There's also Steam line. And there's a manual valve. That guy's on the lockout. That guy's not normally full open. It's normally throttled to like four turns open. Or something in that ballpark. Alright, so 
walk down, off. Those things are on the same, well, these are on the third floor. That was on the second. What else do you look for on a walk down? Loop oil system. All right. So there's a loop oil skid, has a pump, and has a cooler. It goes to the gearbox, and it comes back and goes to the sump. And there's an electric heater in the sump. If you don't need when you're running, but you do need when it's winter and you're trying to start one of these things. You are right. That's out. Kind of like the automotors. You are correct. Two levels on the gearbox. So there's a sight glass on the gearbox, and there's another one up here, right? So check your sight glasses on the gearbox. Can you tell me that electric heater is physically in the gearbox? Wow. Okay, I'm learning stuff. I'm going to have to go walk something down. And then there is cooling water, and then there's, you can go to the sight glass on the cooling water return, and there's like a, like a check valve, but its job isn't really to be a check valve, its job is to be a flow indicator. So, yes, walk down the cut dampers. You can see so there's a little flag coming off it, and then there's a limit switch telling it's open or shut, and that flag's supposed to go up against it. Uh, these aren't on any kind of lockout because all of these things are all powered by one thing. The air pushes them open or shut from one thing, and there's no way to lock it out because the it'll drift. You can turn the air off to it, but there's nothing. There's no springs holding these things in shut in place. The air is open and closed. Uh, before you start these, uh, all these should be shut. They cause a lot of problems coming open, but I don't think there's something you'll find on the walk down. It's just that some of them get old and get sticky and, and are problematic. Put a time six there. Uh, on the mezzanine, go to the actual breaker. Make sure the breaker is shut. Make sure uh, make sure the e stops pulled out on it. That might be it. What else am I missing, Jackie? That's a pretty good walk down I just did. All right. Except for my imaginary sum. You don't see it every day. You don't <laughs> well, that, that's a clear indication of spending too much time in the office. All right. So we want to start up. We walk it down. We look at everything we just said we're going to look at. Then what do we do? Verify that code on the bill. Oh, 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 we are not there yet. Igniters. Igniters. So we got a fuel oil tank and then a fuel oil pump. And then we got what they call a trip valve. And then we got an accumulator. And then we got fuel shutoff valve. And then we got atomizing air valve. So, 
Make sure the accumulator is lined up. Make sure the accumulator has pressure on it. What's the purpose of the accumulator? It's like if you have a gun in and you get ready to put another gun in, you're gonna have a sudden, you may have a sudden drop in pressure, and that accumulator is to keep pressure down on that to try to keep it more steady. Yes. Yes, it compensates compensates for surges in the, the pressure. So what this physically is, is you've got a balloon in there and you've got your, what is it, 90 pounds? 80 pounds of nitrogen inside the balloon and then you've got oil on the outside and that oil is going to, where are we at, we're like a 110 pounds. So that's greater than 80, so that is going to crunch up that balloon. And then when you open this valve, let's see. How's pressure actually controlled out there? So you got a pressure control valve that's maintaining this 110, and then you've got a research valve that is maintaining 200 upstream of that, which is a little complicated. <clears throat> and then when this opens, that 110 pounds dips, and then this balled up nitrogen pushes some oil into the system that gives this valve some time to adjust to make sure that you don't blow out your flames on your other, other legs. All right. So, light off all three pairs of igniters. I'll verify you have flame on all six burners. Then, control room will say that he has all his permits, he's ready for a start. And what's the first step? Bring that up to temperature. Okay, Colgate's actually before that. So, verify coal on the belt. Verify coal on the belt. So the coal gate comes open, and then you'll verify that the coal on the belt, which told you that there was coal in the silo, that there wasn't clogging the pipe, and that the thing actually came open. Uh, sometimes these motors, the position feedback on this is not real. It's counting turns on a motor. It's not looking at a physical limit switch or anything like that. So it's possible for this motor to do its turns and everything, think everything's okay, but for the gears to be stripped out on the inside or for it to have slipped off the gear or something. And so the actual gate itself didn't move. What do we do when we get in that situation? Yeah, pull the back plate off and dig it out. Yeah, unbolt, uh, unbolt the black back plate, and then, yeah, typically you kind of push on it with a pry on it with a bar and get the teeth to meet, and then it comes on. Then somebody, you, the local operator, can get it to come on out. Sometimes it will not say open, but it'll be 90% open, and then you'll have to take the hand wheel and put it in local and give it two cranks or whatever, get it, get it, finish, finish coming up. But Charlie Colgate has been a huge problem over and over again. And I don't know why just that one, because it's the one that gets used. Does it get used the least? It doesn't. Yeah. The mill gets used the least, but that Colgate probably gets cycled more than all the others. Eh? Working it out. All right. So. Coal in the belt. After that, then we put the seal air on. Then we, it opens the guillotine damper. And then it adjusts the airflow. And then it is warming up all the middle of this mill, trying to get it up to the set point. That is 135 Fahrenheit. So there is a timer in there, so you, no matter what the temperature is, it's going to have to blow for 20 minutes to get your permit. For five minutes of that, it's going to put this aux steam in there. For the first five minutes of that, it's going to put the aux steam in there. Um, what the aux steam is there to do is to displace some oxygen, to add a little moisture to the cold, cold dust that's in there to make it a less combustible, less explosive environment. All right. 
So that goes on for 20 minutes. And then he gives, he goes on for 19 minutes, and then he grabs the, the thing and says, one minute to start on Charlie Mill. Then the motor starts, and then the feeder starts. And then when that feeder starts, we're putting all that coal on the belt in there. And that makes this temperature drop, because now it's got to eat up all that coal, and it didn't before, so these dampers have to readjust. What would the uh, cut damper for? Same time after the seal air, but at the same time as the guillotine damper. My bad, I'm not mentioning them. To have that airflow path, all that, that stuff has to happen pretty much at once. We mentioned them earlier, uh, that some of these stick. If, he do, if the control room doesn't see the open, then the timer won't start, and you'll never get your 20 minutes, and you'll never get your mill start. So these open switches, you have to, old yeller, the big sledgehammer, you have to tap it and get them in the right position. Uh, Uh, another thing that's happened with these is these cut dampers, they get an open command and uh, the solenoid doesn't stay hot this whole time that they're supposed to stay open. The solenoid is supposed to latch and stay open. And then it gets a separate close command that unlatches it and then springs shut. Well, that unlatching uh, that latch is worn out. So we went through a phase a couple years ago where a whole bunch of these started failing at the same time. I think, I don't think it was these. I think it was really the seal air that was kicking our ass with it. So it would come open, make its limit, wouldn't latch, didn't know, has no feedback to know it didn't latch. It would stop energizing the solenoid and it would go back shut. And just, I don't know, hit the button again. Hit the button again, you get the exact same thing over and over again. And so a, a lot of these seal air valves had to be rebuilt. Uh, the the short-term workaround on that is to get somebody to get in the DCS, and when you want it open, they just manually tell the solenoid, stay on. You just bypass the logic and say, stay on, and it'll stay open. But the solenoid is not designed to be on all the time, so then you have overheating issues. It's not ideal. The ideal is to actually fix it. But when it comes to between selling megawatts and overheating a solenoid, we're going to pick selling megawatts. And then when we can get the fifth mill on and get this mill shut down, then later, later we'll get the valve really fixed. All right. So, blow of air, mill start, speeder start, then you need to look through the windows and make sure that that belt is tracking. Uh, if maintenance was done on it, if the belt was replaced, if it was calibrated, then somebody might have adjusted the tension and it might not be the same as it was and want to veer off to one side or the other. And then at the back end, there's two springs that adjust that rear roller. And so you crank on one, and you crank on the other, and by moving them both, you can get where you need to get. If you just move one, then you'll run out of play on the other. Or say, you might be trying to turn it to the left, so you keep loosening on the left side. You keep loose. Am I saying that right, Jackie? Does that make that one tight? All right. All depends on the bill. All right. If you want to move up, you got to go. Right side, right side. Yeah. Okay, so, the right side. so you want it to move to the left, tighten the right side. so you tighten the right, you loosen the left. If all you do is loosen the left, eventually the belt gets too loose and the wheel starts slipping. If all you do is tighten the right, then eventually you run out of play on the thing, and you. so it's better to adjust them both. The whole thing can just be too loose, and you have to tighten up on both sides where the motor's turning, but the belt ain't. What else do you watch for? 
Right? Make sure you don't loosen on your coat. Okay? We have to have that broken. Normally, you don't have no trouble out there. Yeah, so in cases where we've had really wet coal in the silo and we're fighting rain rainstorms, then you can get clogged up in here. And then when coal flows out on the belt, that'll trip a thing. Now, if you're still in your start sequence, then you're kind of okay. If you run out of coal, I don't think it just goes straight to a trip. I don't know how long you got before it calls it good and says no coal is a trip. But during you didn't have any coal before, well, why is it there? So there's this little leeway time you get during which you can go and bang on this chute and try and get stuff to fall down. Or just above the valve, that's probably the, the real culprit. And, uh, and there's little vibrators on just on Charlie because it was a problem child at one point. Yep. It's definitely not on all. It's not. If it was on all of them, then the DCS would have a button for it and probably go off every 45 minutes all day. But but that's not how it is. It's something you rig a hose up to, an air hose to, to drive the vibrator. And I'm pretty sure it's just Charlie. All right. Uh, so then, once we have cold flow. It knocks this temperature down. That temperature has to come back up, but not too high. And then uh, you got another 10 minutes of running like that, and then it releases. And then this feeder speeds up, adding more fuel. The other feeders slow down until they all match. And then that is when it is released to modulate. And then all the feeders are moving together to control pressure in the boiler. You take the igniters out. Then you take your igniters out. And uh, a row of igniters is worth uh, 20 to 30,000 pounds of coal an hour. So that's not something you guys care about, but it's something that the control room operator needs to know when he's deciding, can I put a new mill on? Well, if I add 30,000 kpbh of fuel, not, uh, do I have room for the other feeders to back off that much? Because if your feeders are at minimum, and you've added this fuel, and there's no way to back it out, and then what happens? Pressure goes up. Or megawatts go up, but usually at this point, usually in a startup kind of scenario, you don't have the room to put megawatts up yet. You're, all this stuff is locked down. All right. So mill shutdown. A mill shutdown also starts by putting the igniters in. So you line up the accumulator, start the, fuel, uh, the igniter wheel pump, put the row of igniters in. Then the mill speed is going to go to minimum. Then we're going to cool off the mill. So this guy goes shut, and this guy goes all the way open. And we're putting cold air only into the mill to try and cool this down. To 105. So clearly coal is flammable. Tell me about the fire triangle. What are the components required for a fire? Oxygen, fuel, ignition. Right. You have to have ignition or heat. You have to have enough air and you have to have fuel. Uh, and then, uh, what does it take to get an explosion? Dispersion and confinement, right? So, this is a confined box, and you're blowing air into there with the coal powder. And as long as the fuel is rich enough, then you, it, then a spark will not set it off. But if it thins out then that's when you go through a an area where it's dangerous. So before we shut down the feeder and let it thin out, we got to get it cooled down so that we feel like there's not any chance of a spark causing an explosion. What you got? What are we 
what's the air, the PA air at after we start up? It says 135 to start it up to get the permit. Uh, so 135 is the normal set point. I want to say somewhere around 128 is what it takes to actually start it. Um, so yeah, 130. If you're running normally, 135 is what you're going to be at. And we're going to, we got to cool it down to 105. And uh, a control room operator that's trying to conserve fuel will take this set point in in the uh, manual, and he will put type in 115 and cool it down to 115 before he starts putting oil in there. Because why not? And that might save you 10 minutes before it starts to shut down sequence, and that's. 10 minutes of oil at 40 gallons a minute. I mean, that'll move the truck quite a few times. Mm -hmm. All right. So, after it cools down to 105, then the feeder stops. Well, no. Yeah, then the coal gate shuts. Coal gate shuts. And then the feeder runs empty. And then there is a little flap that's riding on the coal. And that flap, when it's not riding, when it, when it runs empty and there's no coal anymore, then that tells the DCS, hey, we ran all the coal out. And uh, I'd say 75% of the time, you guys have to actually grab that thing with a pair of channel locks and tweak on it to get it to actually show. And uh, then after it gets that signal, it runs for another 45 seconds. Uh, Gate actually shuts. If it shuts, should be what about four to five minutes till we should run four minutes. Four minutes, minutes. Four four minutes, minutes almost exactly. Oh. Four minutes almost exactly. Yeah. So if I think what you're leading towards yeah. is if it runs six minutes and the coal hasn't run out, it's probably not gonna. This coal gate's probably not really shut. As we discussed, where the limits are wrong on Charlie in particular where it thinks it's shut, but it's not. All right. After the feeder shuts off, the motor on the mill runs for another five minutes, and then it shuts off, and then we continue to blow air through it for another 10, ooh, somewhere in there off steam came on, I don't remember. I don't know what, what, where that step is. I don't know if that is right now while we're, when we're purging out the coal dust or if that happens when, you're, when you get down to 105 but before the feeder stop. Somewhere in there, this ox team valve comes open. And then you continue to blow air through the whole thing for 10 minutes, make sure all your pipes are purged out good, and then the air shuts down, and that is a good proper mill stop. What will cause a mill to trip? Too much, uh, too much coal. Putting too much coal in. Okay. So if you're putting more coal in than you're blowing out, then you can overfeed it, and this motor will trip. High temperature. So a temperature on the outlet of 165 will trip. No coal. No coal. So if the feeder trips, if the coal gate goes shut, both of those things will trip the mill. What would cause you to get this 165? Uh, uh, is that the, uh, the valve right there that, that uses the temperature yeah, control? All right, so a failure on the temperature control, that's a good theory. Yes, that, that would, in fact, get it there. That's not why it's there. Why it's there is if this coal chute gets clogged up with wet coal and the coal stops falling down, then you have to worry about blowing this thing into that, that thinned out environment, right? Going through an explosive stage. Well, since you're not putting coal in there to cool off or to cool off the air this air temperature starts going up in response so that 165 was picked as a, a number that shows the temperature is rising above normal 
which is an indication that you've lost cold flow through other means. It's kind of defense because there used to be a vindicator on here to tell you that the cold shoot was stopped up. And those things tripped the mills all the time for no, when we didn't want them tripped. So uh, because we bypass those, we have to have that 165 in there to protect against. Occasionally, remember I talked about these dampers not working? Uh, I think it's, it was Echo that was really bad about having those dampers leak by. So the hot air dampers would leak by and we'd have trouble keeping it below that 165 during a start when there's no coal in there at all. And we wouldn't be able to blow for 20 minutes because in seven minutes you get to your 165 and the whole thing would, would trip and be over. There's uh, misalignment switches on the belts. Those don't trip the belt. That's something else that I think used to trip it. And they decided they, they'd rather have it just be warnings. What is that? Obviously, we say it all the time. What's that dispatch blow? All right. So remember those vindicators that used to trip the mills? We took them out, and then we replaced them with lasers. And this laser system was supposed to be able to tell that there was cold flowing and tell it that everything was fine. Those didn't work one lick. We, we did all five of them in an outage instead of just doing one as an experiment. And all five of them don't freaking work. They, they tell you it's plugged all the time, even though it's not. Every now and then, Alpha. <laughs> Every now and then, Alpha knows that it's flowing cold. All right, what else trips it? All right, if, if the boiler trips for any other reason, low drum level, or uh, loss of both start water pumps, or generator breaker comes open for whatever reason, all those things that would trip the boiler, that trip the unit, trip all five mills, or however many mills you got running. Hopefully it's just one. Yeah, because it sucks bad enough to sweep four, <laughs> and then yeah. sweep five. Flame scanners, there's, uh, there's two for each burner, and if you get four of them showing that there's no flame, boy, that might be three. Loss of flame can trip the mill. And I don't know, of, I don't know how many burners are that, but one burner blowing out will not trip the mill. Go, oh, okay, that, you, you can handle it. But too many of them blowing out will trip the mill. Low airflow will trip the mill. That's a rare problem. Uh, it's kind of related to the too much coal that we talked about earlier building up in there. If you don't have enough air, it's the same problem as having too much coal. You, you end up clogging it up and tripping it. So there's a trip prior to tripping on, on backed up that says, hey, you don't have enough airflow. You can't, you can't keep this up, dude. Uh, the only time I can think of that happening was we were uh, doing some sort of efficiency testing and some engineers were observing the mills and they said, let's try less primary air. Let's put a bias in there. Let's put a negative bias in there. And they, they kept walking that bias down until they walked it down all the way to the trip set point. A good control room operator would know he was getting close to that set point and would tell the engineer, go to hell, this is my plant, I'm not doing that. But back, back in the day, none of us were good control room operators. We were all taking the word of engineers on how things actually work. Loss of seal air, there's a seal air pressure transmitter, and there's a VP trans uh, pressure between uh, the, the seal air. Uh, low seal air will, I don't think that will trip the mill, but I think it does ruin your start permit. So if this 
no matter what the seal air valve says, if you don't have seal air pressure, then you can't get through your start sequence. Lube oil pressure will trip the mill. So loss of a lube oil pump obviously will trip the mill. Say that again? Say that. Yes. <laughs> Profi bus will trip the mill. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I followed her lost a finger. Yeah. So that's go shut, the uh, guillotine damper goes shut, the motor stops, the feeder stops. Colgate does not automatically go shut. So be aware of that as something you need to make sure happens before you start cleaning out the feeder. So we got coal in the mill, we've got some coal laying in these pipes somewhere, and we got coal sitting on the feeder, and none of that is okay. Uh, this coal, you leave it laying around, it starts getting hot, leave it laying around too long, it's going to smolder and catch on fire and burn up your belt or burn up some equipment. Or it's bad. It's, no, no, it's bad luck. So, how do we get rid of it? How do we get rid of all that coal in the system? Just pull the mill. Mill sweep. All right. So, for a mill sweep, we shut the can, uh, cut damper, chain damper. We keep all the cut damper shut. We put seal air on. Pyrite hopper top gates open. We line up the pyrite hopper with sluice and water. I got more stuff to draw. Where does the sluice and water come from? Wastewater. Sump three. Where does it go? Bob Mash and Drag Chain. Those are the same answer. Way up here on the top left. Say what? You drag chains way up here on the top left. <laughs> Bottom ash, you were not, sir. Yeah. It's like that. <laughs> Not the scale. Not the scale. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you open that water valve, you open that water valve, you get your flow. Order matters there. If you open that one before that one, then you pressurize this leg of pipe that's not used to seeing pressure and it blows water out the cracks and it might blow apart the junctions. Um, once you've established that flow, you can open that bottom gate. You're not allowed to open that bottom gate if the top gate is open because the logic is worried about blowing water up into the mill. So first you'll see the top gate go shut, then the bottom gate come open, then the top gate comes open again. This is, this is a Venturi, a uh, jet pump. So it's like the... Uh, it's like fertilizer wands you use, right? You've got your, you've got your miracle grow, and you've got your hose of water running across, and it sucks the miracle grow out and mixes it with your water. It's like that. It's sucking whatever's in here out and blowing it over to the bottom ash. So, cut damper shut, chain gate shut, seal air on, line up the sluice, then we start the mill motor. And then all the stuff that's in there gets ground up and then without any air to carry it out, it ends up under this table. And there's two scraper arms that carry it and dump it into the pirate hopper. And then you're watching this pirate hopper and you've got water 
lined up at the throat there, and you've got water blowing at your screen there. And then you got water that's blowing straight down. I said screen, I meant, I meant the sight glass. And then you got a grating in here. That's clogged. That's clogged up on Alpha. Which I guess I didn't see it coming. You know, I I saw that they replaced the, the grating with a smaller grating, and I was like, huh, should be fun. Let's still catch the rocks and pull them out. But no, nope, you get rocks the exact right size of that, and it's a problem. Alright. Well, we're sleeping. About what time do we start putting the dirty steam in that? Uh yeah, right before the mills, anytime before the motor starts. Okay. And this if is that time have, where you'll be really thankful that you got to crank down to four turns, or two turns, three yeah. turns, somewhere in there, because if it is wide open, then this is not a pleasant place to be. Yeah. It's not a pleasant place to be anyway. All right, so then we're shoving all this coal in here, and then it builds up and covers a sight glass. And then you call a control room, say, shut the top gate. The top gate goes shut, and the sluice and water keeps going, and all the stuff that built up in there now gets to fall through. And then you say, open the top gate. Well, he can't open the top gate. No, he can't. Yeah, he can't open the top gate if the bottom gate's open. So he's got to shut the bottom gate, open the top gate, open the bottom gate back up. That's what they want to see. So. Uh, and then you'll you'll watch it, and then it'll fill up again, and the amount it takes longer each time until after I don't know five or ten of these cycles, you go, all right, that it's still dusty, but that's as good as it's going to get. Someday after we open up the tank glass to wash it out, big chunks of it up there too, wash it out, clean it. Yeah. Prior to starting, we should have already. With the top gate shut, open that side glass and pulled out all the all the rocks we can. And then in the middle, you might have to do that again. You might have to shut that top gate and then open the glass and then clear stuff out. Okay. And this is one of those times when there's actual coordination going on between the control room and the guy on the floor. And the control room's pretty much doing what you say. He can't see when this thing's full and when it's not. So he kind of got to listen to you, and then you got to kind of be a little patient with him because these valves don't operate quite as fast or as orderly as you might want them to, especially if you don't realize that he's got to have this one shut to be allowed to open that one. <coughs> and then you're like, why the hell is he doing that? Does he even know what button he's pushing? I didn't say anything about the damn bottom game. Part of how it works. All right. So then you tell him you got a good sweep, and he shuts off the motor, and then he does a pipe merge. So then you open up the chain gate back up, and then he lines up air, hot air shut, cold air open, and blows cold air through it for 10 minutes. 20 minutes? 10 minutes. I'm not sure. It's in the procedure. Read your procedures, then you'll know. And that's a mill sweep. That's close to everything I know about pulverizers. Hundred <laughs> percent. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a bunch. It's a bunch. Let's see. Right, let's come up with a guesstimate. So at a full load, a silo drops about 10% in an hour. And at full load, one of these is putting out 80 kbph. 80 kbph is 90 tons an hour. So 10% is 90 tons. So then I got 900 tons in my whole silo based on that thumbnail calculation. It is. And we fill those silos four times a day. We, we burn. 
If we're pushing full load all day, we'll burn between eight and 9,000 tons. If we're only pushing 45% load, we'll burn 5,000 tons. <laughs> but we'd rather be pushing full load for multiple reasons. One, one is it means we're making money. If they're not asking for full load, it means they can't sell the megawatts enough to, to keep us in the black. Uh, another is the unit just Everything is tuned for that full load. Everything is tuned for 730 gross megawatts. So it's more efficient. And also starting and stopping. Uh, motors are like 10 times more likely to fail on a start or stop compared to when they're just running. So the more consistently we can keep everything running, the better. All right, that's all I got. Anybody got any questions? Anything to add? Anything you think I missed, Jackie? Same thing right there. All right. Did better than usual. Except for that something.